You're watching Spotlight, a production of Culture in Maine, York's cultural showcase. I'm Carla Christopher, poet, publisher, and producer. Join me along with editor, musical guru, and video extraordinaire Jay Schmuck, plus wild outdoorsman and videographer, along with technical extraordinaire Cliff Kern, and all of our friends as we go behind the scenes and get into the underground of what's really going on in the arts and cultural amazing explorations that are happening in South Central Pennsylvania. You'll see everything from art to music to dance to theater and you'll also get to meet the people who really make it happen. Find out how and why along with some great studio performances, some amazing on-the-street footage. You'll also get the real story. And that's what we're here to shine a spotlight on. Let's go. kid there was this guy one of my best friends his name was William and I love this guy you might have seen him before you might know who he is and I loved him so much and I wanted to know what he was doing at all times he wrote poems and sonnets and most of all he wrote these wonderful plays and I was into them the tragedies the comedies whatever they were well he had this theater right and this theater was called the Globe Theater awesome place in England I'm not gonna get in how many seats there were but everyone went there the royalty the people who own things uh, Everyone in the whole town went there, and especially the largest group of people, which is like most of us, the groundlings. And they called them the groundlings because they sat on the ground to watch what was going on. Well, they took that stage, that Globe Theater stage, and they tilted it about a foot lower in the front than it was in the back, okay? And why they tilted it was because the people on the ground would not have been able to see what was happening on the stage unless they tilted it. Not like when you play, uh, you know, ping pong, uh, the pin pinball machine, and it tilts but they tilt to the front of the stage. That's why we call in the modern stage, we still call the front of the stage downstage and the back of the stage upstage. But now we do this, like what you see behind you, we rake the seats so that they're actually on the incline. But even as a young child, the concept of tilting the stage was more than just dropping the front of the stage down a foot. So here's me, you know, here I am, uh, this little kid right here, kind of blurry, but uh, almost androgynous. And I understood that tilting the stage was more than just lowering the front. It was about creating access to the arts more than anything else for me, for me. And art wasn't just, you know, what was on a piece of paper or music or film or making music. It was all these things. And my mother, growing up in uh, the first of my life in Brooklyn, she made all these things very accessible to me. And my first, first record, it's a big CD, um, <laughs> was The Wiz. And I remember going to see it on Broadway. And for me, you see this empty slide? Life was an open canvas after The Wiz. You know, it was like anything art that I could get my hands on, I wanted a piece of it. Whether it was singing, dancing, or acting, I wanted to be a part of it, and I wanted to know how everything worked. So with that said, at that young age, everything starts to become art to me, even the things that other people thought were messes. And I, it became taxing to me to try to figure out 
how I could share this with my friends who thought I was a little bit crazy and a little bit wacky when I would put mud on a piece of white paper and go, oh, that's art. Or I write a poem about it or sing a song. And I started to realize that everybody sees art in different ways. And if in fact we're going to tilt the stage for people, we have to start recognizing what they see as art and what we see as art and be able to explain that to them, right? It makes sense. So we're different types of people, right? All different shapes and sizes and colors. We all have different backgrounds. But what we all have built into us is a desire to tell our story. We all have some story, and we look for others who have similar stories to ours. And I think that's a major way that we find uh, that we find each other in this crazy little world that we're living in. Now, for some people, art is scary. That might be a scary picture. And for others, that is mystery. But how do we, as a people, take what we're learning, what we accept as art, uh, whether it be acting, dancing, singing, any of the major pieces, and make it accessible to everyone? Is it about money? Well, sometimes it is. Is it about being classic or about being a little bit funky? It, sometimes it is. But more than anything else, it's accessibility. And so what I'm speaking about today is more than about what art is or about what art is to me as much as it is a challenge to you to find your way to tilt your stage. I mean, uh, this to someone might just look like cracked, you know, uh, a cracked wall, but it's Marilyn Monroe to others, you know? And if I didn't know that this is a rendition of something that came from another artist, if I didn't have those things brought to me at a young age, it wouldn't mean anything. So what is your song? What is the, the part of you that screams out? Where do you create your art? And how do you open your life and open your doors to others who need to create. Now, we hear about all kinds of violent things that happen in our city and all the craziness out there, but I'm taxing each one of you to be your own little mad scientist, okay? And start experimenting with how you can make art accessible to others. I don't care if you work in a hospital or if you work in LSC design or if you work in uh, you know, uh, a school. What is artistic there and what do you have accessible to you? What makes you a renaissance man or woman? What makes you the conduit to someone else learning about your art and what is around you? What do you have to do? I'm not asking you to necessarily open your pockets, although that would be wonderful. But I am asking you to recognize that the way we create these Renaissance men and women, our future businessmen and women, is by recognizing that those who've embraced the arts as a part of their everyday life, these are the outside of the box thinkers. There's a reason for tilting the stage more than just for the sake of the art. Although for me, I would be more than happy since I've never had any other job but the arts, I do recognize what it's done for people. So here we are, all reaching out to one another, trying to help each other up that hill, right? trying to figure out how we're going to make it to the next day. How we're going to do that. And how the arts get us there. And especially in a town like this where you can actually see that the arts are actually starting to take a look at us and turning forward to us. So I'm challenging each and every one of you today. They look really happy on that picture. I'm challenging you to take a look at our city and take a look at the art that it is the living art that it is every, every, each and every day, and where you fit in to making this place more art accessible. Whether it's opening your home, opening your car, setting up a, a, a pop-up gallery, or just standing out on the street and giving your art. How will you tilt the stage? Thank you.
So today is Saturday. We leave on Monday for Macedonia. Just tidying up a few things in the shop before we um, start going home and packing our things for this trip and this endeavor. I just have to say I'm very honored. I feel very privileged to be a part of um, this literary movement here in New York City and in the United States and to be a part of it and to represent my country and my city in uh, Macedonia on the other side of the globe is a really great honor. Um, I'm a little nervous, a lot of pressure, but um, I know that destiny is calling and um, I'm going to follow this path wherever it takes me. Um, and I hope for the viewers at home that you can, you know, especially for the writers and, and the poets out there, um, you know, when I was growing up in, in high school and writing was a big thing and a, and a big outlet for me, um, people used to make fun of me and laugh at me because they said, oh, you'll never be able to make a living at that, why don't you choose a real career? And um, if I would have listened to those naysayers, none of this would have been happening for me. If I would have given up and just settled for my standard nine to five job, you know, because of health insurance and this and that, um, these dreams would never have manifested. So my message to you is to keep doing what you do, what you love, whatever your calling is in life, pursue it. Don't count the cost. If you count the cost, you might not finish your goal or achieve your goal. So. My message to you is just keep moving forward, keep pushing for what you love. Um, I know poets don't get paid primarily. We're probably actually one of the lowest paid artists within the artistic field. But um, I have a small bank account, but I'm a very rich man. So we'll see you in Macedonia. Hi. Okay, audience. Travelocity never used. Just completely messed up my ticket by giving me Dustin Nispel's last name instead of me. So therefore, you have issues with trying to go overseas and your passport and things just aren't adding up. So a lot of havoc, stress, Dustin, freak out what moments. What I was saying was that thanks to a wonderful assistant working with United here at the Harrisburg Airport, she was able to override everything so that way the Austrian situation will view me and everything will be matched up accordingly. I did have to show every form of identification known to mankind since I've come to this earth 27 years ago, but it worked. I had a serious meltdown. A serious meltdown. We're okay now. We are okay. In fact, We'll be leaving very soon, in the next 25 minutes, to Chicago, and then from Chicago, we will travel to Vienna. And from Vienna, we shall travel to Skopje. See you in Chicago. and fix the problem so that we can board Austria, Austrian Airlines from here to go to Vienna. So the next time that we see you, we will be in Vienna. We'll probably take some shooting, uh, we'll take some shots around, around the airport here. Um, we're gonna grab something to eat though, we're super hungry, so we're gonna try to find something good to eat.
capers. And capers, yes. Australian so style food. Capers. Australian style food. Yep, same. Oh, wow, look at awesome. that. That looks like big seed. A little bit. That's right. There we are. Skopje departs at 10.05 and then uh, we will have made it to Macedonia within 24 hours, which is pretty great. As you can tell, I'm very tired. The flight was not very comfortable. Um, we did have some good whiskey though. There's some good whiskey. It was a little strong, but it was good. Um, yeah, so when we get to Skopje, we'll really start this documentary. We made it to Europe. Woo! Hey Dustin, we hey. made it. We did make it. It was um, kind of scary. Um, the first thing that went wrong, you all know about because we recorded that earlier. And then once we arrived in Tetoba, nobody was there. Nobody was there. It was and us. It was just us. So we took a cab to Tetoba. Um, the cab driver was really awesome. Um, he really tried to help us find the, to the hotel that was. Um, arranged for us because our phones don't work here in the United States. So, um, but yeah, our phones don't work here only in the United States. So we weren't able to get online and see what was going on, what the hotel address oh, was. Help. But we found help at the American Corner Totovo and they let us get online and use their computers and we were able to find out exactly where we had to go, our where our reservations were. So we have made it to Emka Hotel in Totovo, Macedonia. And oh man, it feels good to finally be here. And then we have this really nice bathroom. I'm excited to shower after a really long, crazy adventure. Perfect. Like a delicioso food bon appetit. Authentic. It's a real chicken, real beef, and real vegetables. And uh, you guys, you don't know. I love it's very authentic, very delicious. And we're just having a conversation. So, uh, about the rice and rice Nothing ever disappears. Not all the paths we have walked. Not all the constellations we've stared at before falling asleep. Not all the traces we have left. Not all the airplanes we have watched take off. Not all the trains we've missed. Not all the raindrops on the windshields of all the cars we have to take. How is one to gain control of one's life under such conditions? One of them were Fork, another at Wellington. One of them was reading a newspaper, the other Heidegger, and the streets were flooded with rain. At the boulevard, the French princess entered the bus of Furic and Furious, and I felt for her yearly, but she jumped off in front of the police station and was replaced by two sirens with flaming kerchiefs who spoke freely with each other. As years go by, your presence, your presence has shared the bread of its dominion, the soul breathing, the unique spelling of its constellations. <clears throat> I bury you within the walls of my flesh. You are the space where the particles that conform the feeling I am move by, the clumsy luck of being a rat or a humble a non lounge land. Blue eye. I found grotesque. Uh, what's one? Albania. A sapphire dragonfly coming from somewhere in the woods uh, rests on a blade of grass uh, by a fountain called Blue Eye. Uh, thank you very much. From the poor, rewire the world and lecture it to spoil. You could take from mankind, giving nothing in return, build immunity, repelling mercy, and watch independence set fire and burn. Oh, how the greedy wheels turn. But rich, 
was only a mild man, just another number out of a dirty dozen barrel trying to make it to his independence lane. Like it's practice, saran wrapped in plastic, packaged and shipped out to some fashion show with pure brass racks for your jackets. Yeah, you're hung. Do you resume refracturing the task back to the past? When the solution's right in front of you, you just can't grasp it. See, it's love. And it's time to fast track it rather than backtrack into the last actions because poor elastic breaks and snaps back in two half sections and it only brings pain until you change your ranges on perfection. Um, Shaib has brought us here for dessert and ice cream even after a huge like seven course of fulfilling meal. Uh, we did some poetry, as we just captured, and then now we wanted to show America good dessert, uh, authentic dessert here in Macedonia. It's beautiful. It's an uh, art in itself. And again, our, our friend Colby Ritter would really love this. I think these are bananas and chocolate, a lot of pastries. Oh, yeah. Wow. First night that we were here, we had a dinner date, <laughs> and Justin and I actually have pictures. We shared a bottle of wine and had some pizza together. And this little fella came up to us, and um, we shared some food with him and some scratches and lovings. And now it's uh, been tradition. The last couple nights that we've actually been here, um, randomly we come outside on their back patio, the dining area, for a cigarette and espresso. And uh, he joins us, and sometimes if we have food, which tonight we don't, we feed him. Um, and he seems to know that the hotel uh, workers and servers actually say, yeah, he's, he stays around. So um, he seems to merge with us. We call him our Macedonia kitty. 
Uh, we named him Spaghetti, which is a spaghetti or pasta in Albanian, um, which we learned that in our endeavor here. And he's just a freaking cutie. And uh, uh, we almost thought he was a spiritual messenger from our kitty cats at home um, coming to check up on us. And <laughs> as you can see, he's very friendly. Hey man, to the hotel? To the hotel back. I just need to Come with me then. Yes, Come on, everybody. Come on. The Poet Society, yes? Hey. We must cross the road here. So I'm here with uh, Damal, who's the son of Shaib Emerlau. Uh, he was explaining to me about uh, the brothers of Naeem Frazier. Uh, yeah, as you can see, Naeem Frazier is uh, the most famous Albanian writer. Uh, he had, uh, he's with all his brothers, uh, Abdul Frazier, Naeem Frazier, Sami Frazier, and nephews. He, uh, uh, they all created the culture of uh, Albanian, the brother of uh, Naim created, uh, uh, which is called Sami Frashli, created uh, the alphabet of Albanian language. So uh, they are our 
I don't know what to say, man. There are there's Albanian. They they represent the Albanian country. They that's what I can say. They, they help so, create the literacy language. Yes, yes. They fight for uh, our language. For uh, that uh, our language can have an alphabet, can have a culture, can have a, everything that a uh, language needs. Yeah, that's why uh, my father took name as a figure of the festival last year. Because he's a poet, a very famous Albanian poet.
not here. <laughs> we have to put... Nineteen thirty-one, uh, the Moscow is burned, and all this uh, zone is burned. Yes. Eighteen thirty-one. And it comes Abdurrahman Pasha. Yeah. It builds this Moscow more bigger and bigger. Yes. When they colored with this, they have uh, spent uh, 50,000 eggs with eggs. Jack Lepri and the Chirech. Blood of the rabbit and uh, Chirech. Chirech uh, is uh, the one that you built uh, the house. The blocks and you put it uh, and you put another block. Is mortar. Yeah, like. Yeah, this they have made with this. Blood this rabbit and this. <laughs> So here we are in Tatova, Macedonia. Today is the day of the opening reception and the ceremony. Jessica and myself will be performing Bottom of the Blossom together as a duo on their national television for Macedonia. So this television program will air throughout the entire country on the national television network. So wish us luck York City, wish us luck USA. Um, we are going to represent our country, our city, and all we are as human beings today. So, a lot of pressure, right? Thank you. We'll see you soon.
e a mulher do sexo que é de Eden e Chifre e Poetas. A Taia Jessica Fion de Dustin Nepal. Na Chifre e Poetas. who will take the prizes because all the poets are very, very good. So this year it was really difficult to decide and they did a kind of compromise. So they decided to give the same prize, Chiriu in Aemi, for three writers. <laughs> so one was uh, the writer from Macedonia, uh, Poetia Remzi Salio, and the second is Jessica Glynn and Dustin Nova. You take one prize together. <laughs> uh, so you can vote in the Legion Salio, Cretari Uris for Tudor Zuart Schmini. I invite Mr. Salegin Salio to give the prize. undercover for the better part of my natural life. That despite the dermal absence of pigment, my tongue was a knife, cutting racial ties from a distance. That I was an indignant figment of difference, a refreshing vision of existence in between the lines of limits. I told her it was hard to look at myself in the mirror every day. That my ancestors who paved the way did so in a ballet of suffering and slavery. Ignorance as a blanket covering unsavory, I said. That my eternal element is irrelevant, that my soul is fumes yeah, and my heart is gelatin. Yes, I'm the skinny, white elephant in the room. Call me Horton. Trust me, I hear you. A person's a person, no matter how small, no matter their hue, religious views, or how many times they fall. And if you, and if you choose to stand for truth above all the snakes that slither and crawl, if we, as a people, stop feeding them, they will wither, die, and dull. We must become the eagle, rise above the evil, drop the guns, drop the hate, drop the needle. The season's over, but we're the sequel. A beacon of Eden where all people are equal. Yeah, this white boy's words are lethal. Atomic envoy poetically deployed as affirmative action, reactively acting, yet peaceful. I'm exacting, precisely operating, no better, no less, but equal. Cooperating as I am no longer tolerating anything less than building a better, brighter future for all of mankind.
oh, what it means to write poetry. To give birth from a piece of me pouring out as if I were bleeding ink and through my finest seams, release and recover my heartbeat. Release and recover monsters inside of me. Release and recover. I once swore I'd write life stories to read, a form of self-condolence. And so it would seem so relevant to the ears that were listening from those of you watching and breathing that others would long to release and recover with me. Until what hurts inside no longer haunts our dreams and the buildup of puddles in our eyes could flow honestly, draining the pain as it sinks to the bottom of the sea. An emotional tide could sweep away our demons disguised. We could coast across reluctantly and sail to the other side, cutting loose from our anchors and suppose we make it there alive. Theoretically envision that place and paradise, believing we can touch it by reaching with hands and stretching our skin just seeing it could be behind my adult as I wanted to on the land of us future. The body that dreaming is not merely for sleeping. It is, however, a factual relief. Our subconscious was trying to speak through visions not impossible to reach the reality we may now feel trapped in, but we are not just dead cells dusted off from imagination, locked into a void as we're struggling to want to wake up. If you listen closely to the breaths you take in, we are gasping for something more fulfilling. Now please just wake up with me and follow the sound of your heartbeat. Navigate your ships away from war zones and gasoline leaks. Hoist your <laughs> sails to catch your paradise stream. Release and recover with me. Release and wake up with me. Release and recover. Goodbye, monsters inside of our seas. Thank you. Yeah. 
many nations cooperating, having fun, celebrating life. It's community on an international Diversity level. And unity. On an international level. I hope one day that the entire world comes together as one people, as one human race, and we set aside our differences as we have here, and we all celebrate life together. Justin and Jessica would like to thank all of our contributors and donors for making this trip possible for us. Swala Idesatima, John Rudolph Beaton, Nina Greenplay, Marisa Porter, Seth Shimkonis, Nina Kotkamp, Anna Jane, Yvonne Yi, Brianna Eckenrode, Denna Bateman, Craig Floyd, Jordan David, Dan Walchick and Sean Young of Volcania Graphics, Joseph Carrera, Adele Earlrich, Corey Endicott, Chuck Basket, Sean Fletcher, the Celebration of Life Ballistics Expo, John Ryan, Robert Nispel, Elsie Smith, Patricia Teller, Sue Hess, Bill Trivet of New Visions Books and Gifts, Anna Dolceco, Ken Ebert, Joanne Shannon, Adam Holquist, Ian Carroll, Craig Nispel, Shane Tanzamore, Matt of the York Rescue Mission, Jane Jensen, Aunt Jo and Uncle Fred, Lee Hinton and Iris Tree Press, Richard Schindel, Don and Lisa Nispel, Matt Paulus and the IBEW Electrical Union Local 229, Peggy and Brian Smith, Kenneth Vincent Walker, Maria James Chow, David Smith and Steve Billet of Ironic, Javier Cotal, and Christine Lincoln, the York Poet Laureate and the countless of contributors through all of our open mics at the Rooted Artist Collective that have graciously donated money towards our cause. Without you guys, this trip would not have been possible. Thank you so much. We love you guys. We hope that this documentary serves as an inspiration to all of those artists out there, to the dreamers. This one was for you guys. Thanks for joining us on another amazing episode of Spotlight, a production of Culture in Maine, York's cultural showcase. We want to hear your ideas and we want you to be a part of the show. Whether you're an artist or a fan, send us an email to cultureinmaine at gmail.com. Check us out on the web at wrct.tv or make sure to find all of our past episodes on YouTube at youtube.com backslash White Rose Community TV. Thanks again for joining us and have a great week. We'll see you soon, right here on the corner of Culture in Maine. Now you know where no comes from.